welcome. Today is Hump Day, Wednesday, October 19th, 2022. I am Solid Blue Sister, and this is My Turn to Talk. Hey, Shelby, welcome. Seems like, let's see, you're number one today. Frankie, hey girl, you're number two. Hope everyone is having a wonderful day. It has been a beautiful morning and day for me in Southern California. Hey, Brina, how are you? Welcome back, Blood Ninja. Hey, how are you, girl? Welcome back. And I do truly hope everyone is enjoying their day. watching or listening on whichever platform you stream on, I am everywhere now, so welcome. Welcome, welcome, and everyone saying hello to each other. <laughs> Frankie saying, girls in the house. Okay, so I'm going to get started, and everyone can uh, pop in as they may, and I apologize to people who are watching me live. Uh, I didn't have myself on screen. I am on screen now, so... Okay, so today I want to talk about surrogates and sperm donors. Are you prepared not to stick around? So if you are a, um, if you make the choice to become a surrogate, um, or if you are a man and you decide to be a sperm donor, um, are you prepared not to be in that child's life? Now for a sperm donor, um, I think, it may be a little easier. Um, they may have it a, a little easier because they can go to a sperm bank, they can donate to a sperm bank, or they may know the, the, um, the person um, and they can, you know, donate their sperm that way, not saying necessarily physically, but, you know, if, if, if it was your friend or something, you know, they came and they asked you to do it, you know, um, when you make that decision, um, do you pre- are you prepared not to be in, in that child's life? Are you prepared um, to not have a say? So if it, if it is your friend and you're doing this person a favor and let's say one day, you know, um, you see them in the store or even maybe they let's say you know that person and they that child is in your life just because of the fact that you know this person hey 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 gp welcome um and the parent or parents whomever it may be is disciplining this this child will you be able to just not step in. Crucible, welcome. Will you be able to just sit back and just be silent? Now, um, uh, Juju, welcome. So that's why I say if you are a man, you may have it a little easier if you were just to go to a, to a sperm bank, okay? Um, but for women, Um, I do believe it is a little different because women, some women, you know, they um, make a living for some women being being surrogates, you know, Um, but should you 
at any point during that time where you're signing away your rights and everything, do you ever have the right to step in? Whether that child is a baby, whether they're in elementary school, they're in high school, they're 40 years old, do you ever have a right to step back into that child's life unannounced, unwanted, uninvited? Um, so that's, that's, that's what uh, um, I, I'd like to know today. Those, that, that's my, my question or questions. So let's see what you guys are talking about. You guys are saying hello to each other. Um, ba, ba, ba. And Cuspo and Shelby are pod being partners. Okay, Brina says, I think when people do it out of goodness of their heart, they understand they won't be able to intervene. Unless it's really abuse, they can't step in. Okay, all right. But Brina, if it is, wait, Crucible, uh, hold on, I didn't catch you there. But, but, but Brina, if you if it is a abuse, would you step in as a friend or as a concerned person, or are you stepping in as the parent? Like you're abusing my child, but is the child really yours? Okay, okay, so you would step in as a c concerned person. Okay, so do you think that um, uh, people have the right to step in as the parent? I mean, how, let me put, put it like this. How many people do you think if they are the sperm donor or a surrogate and they know the person, what do you think? I mean, because I don't know. What do you think the percentages are of people who actually stay silent, especially if that person is indirectly in that child's life? Uh, Sabrina says, no, they've already agreed not to be the parent. Okay. Okay. So, uh, let's see, I am going to start with ladies first. Uh, Shelby? Um, on this note, I think I agree with Brina. I think that, you know, if you assigned an agreement as far as a surrogate, um, you um, really, you can't really say anything. Um, and as a sperm donor, um, it depends on to me um did they go to a sperm bank or do they know this person well um, let's say that let's say that they that they know this person th they can't say anything either um that would have to be you know you, ca you can't say anything i mean they they sign an agreement okay you know, that, right. that would be their child you know you can just hope and pray that they're treating that child right, you know. Okay. Um, Crucible, welcome. Hello, Solid. Hello, everybody. Yeah, I agree with both Brina and and Shelby on, on this one. I'm not intimately familiar with all the ins and outs of how um, – surrogate and sperm don donation works. I, I do know there are two, there are probably two ways you can do it. One is anonymously through a, through a sperm bank. And the other obviously is if you know the person, but through a sperm bank, if, if I'm, and correct me if I'm, I'm missing something, cause I probably am through a sperm bank, you, you donate your sperm. They place it in a device or they put it someplace in the hopes of fertilizing an egg. I'm guessing if the fertilization is successful, they would notify you that you have fertilized an egg. Now, whether they tell you who that person is and give personal details, that I don't know, and I would be surprised if they did give that out because in my world, and again, we're getting into moral maybe versus legal, and they do sign paperwork from what I understand, relinquishing their rights as a parent, but just because you provide, and I understand how the chromosome situation works, just because you provide one half of the fertilization process does not, I don't believe, entitle you to be a parent. There's obviously more to parenting than simply providing the egg or, or, or the sperm. So I would be very, very reluctant if I were the woman to let the sperm donor into the child's life. In fact, I would probably be adamantly against it. 
because who knows what that woman has planned for the rest of her life. She may be planning to get married. She may be planning to live with somebody who may adopt the child. And now you've confused the situation because that sperm donor is probably not going to play a prominent role in the life. It sounds kind of selfish to me. It's kind of like I was there when this happened. Therefore, dot, 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 I'm entitled to, you know, dot, dot, dot. So I'd have to be pretty, pretty tough on drawing those lines there because I just think it, it's bad for the child. Okay, so I'm I'm, I'm going to ask this, and and uh, Crucible, I do believe that when you when you, if you go to a a, a sperm bank, they are um, putting the sperm inside of the female, so the female is walking around pregnant. It's not like the baby is born in a test tube or anything. There, the woman is pregnant. Um, but okay, so let me ask uh, ask this um, question. And GP says it's a stress it's a stressful situation. So let's say um, you know the person. Okay, the the surrogate you 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 would know. Um, you may not know them personally, but you know you hired them. Whatever they carry this baby, whatever. Um, or you know the sperm donor. The sperm donor could be, um, you know. Maybe your husband passed away and you asked the brother or, I mean, something. Um, let's say this child gets sick. Let's say they need a transplant. Let's say they need bone, bone marrow or, or whatever. Um, at that point, do you, the parent, after you've told me to sign this paperwork and to stay out of the child's life, and if you see us at, you know, at parties or whatever, don't say anything. You know, as far as they know, you're just Miss So and So or Mr. So and So or Aunt So and So or whatever. Don't say anything. But all of a sudden, um, this child gets sick and you're knocking on my door. Should I have to um, donate whatever? Uh, and if I say no, do you have the right to get upset? So, Shelby? I think um, in that situation, you're not obligated to because, like, they, like you said, they signed over their parental rights. Um, but I have not yet seen a parent not care about a child enough to not want to. Okay, so let's say you were, were the surrogate mm -hmm. and you're now married, okay? Or maybe you were married while you were the, the surrogate. And now um, this, your friend or whomever is, or comes back to you and says, you know, hey, Shelby, you know, um, my daughter or my son, blah, 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 you know, um, they need a bone marrow or they need a kidney, whatever. But your husband is saying, well, wait, hold on. You know, that's a that's a serious, you know, surgery, whatever. You have two other kids here, whatever. No. What do you do? First of all, my husband can't tell me what to do. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, he, okay. Now he's, he's not necessarily telling you, but he's voicing his opinion. And, but, and the yeah. rest of your family are voicing their uh, uh, opinion. So I understand what you're saying that what parent would not, but, you know, let's say it is a, a situation where someone says, Shelby, you, you have been the, the surrogate. I want you to make sure you stay out of this child's life. Do not do this. Don't try to contact us. Don't do anything. But all of a sudden, five years later, I'm knocking on, on, on your door saying, Shelby, my, my, my daughter is really sick. Can, can you blah, blah, blah. Well, I'm, like I said, I don't think the parents should feel obligated to do it. Um, okay. Okay. I, you know, that's, that's up to the parent, you know, that, uh, I mean, like if they like, the, you know, they sign the agreement not to be in the child's life and, you know, they, they can take that into consideration, you know, and some parents could be, you know, I wouldn't say heartless, but, you know, discuss it with the partner either way. And, you know, they they say, well, you know, I'm sorry, but I, I just can't. You know, we agreed not to have me in that child's life. 
Okay. All right. Crucible. Yeah, now you've introduced ethical into the equation of moral and legal. And ethical, you could ask that two ways. You could say, is it ethical? Now, if she has no other options, then ethics kind of goes out the window. But if she has other options, is it ethical for the for the mother to even ask the surrogate father or the sperm donor to be involved in, in an organ donation or some kind of a blood transfer, whatever the situation was, is it ethical to even ask, given the, the circumstances and, and what was signed and whatnot? And the other side of that coin, is it ethical to decline, given the circumstances and that child has been in, brought into this world with the assistance of the sperm donor? Um, does he have a legal obligation? No. Does he have a moral obligation? Possibly. Does he have an ethical obligation? I don't think so. Obligation and ethics really don't go in the same sentence. Ethics is really kind of a guideline to what's right and wrong and what you should do, what does society think you should do. And that kind of conflicts with obligation. Obligation means just what it says. You're, you're supposed to do it. So I would be very leery to get involved there. But again, as Shelby, Shelby said, I'm, I don't think I got, I'm, I'm going to make sure I understood her. You're, you're really not, if you're or donating organs, if you're doing some other medical procedure, you're not quote unquote really in the child's life. You're helping that child stay alive, but that doesn't mean you need to be a physical, visible presence in the life. So again, I think it gets down more to ethics than it does anything else. Okay, so then let me ask, ask this, because now we're talking organ don donation. I give up part of my kidney or part of my liver, or even part of my lung um, to this child that I either was a sperm donor for, or I was the surrogate for. Do I not have a right to kind of want to know how they're doing every so often? And, you know, and do you have, and are you going to tell me, well, no, you've done this now, go away uh, uh, again? So, do I not have the right to want to know? At least, can you tell me how, how they're doing? Do I not have that right to ask? Right is a really difficult word. Um, you you have you have a You have a right to ask. Do you have a right to be entitled? I don't think you do because I think you've forfeited those rights depending on what the language is in the, in the documents. I'm pretty sure you have forfeited quote unquote, you know, I'm using air quotes, rights. Would it be nice? Would it be ethical and moral for the woman to keep you apprised and give you updates once in a while? Of course it would be. She helped you, he helped you bring that child into the world without whom you may not have a child today. But rights, I don't think that's where that would fall. Okay, but you also said, you know, in terms of coming to that person to donate an organ or bone marrow, or whatever, you know, you brought up the ethical, the ethic, the ethics and moral, whatever. And people are, you know, I'm reading the chat, and people are saying, well, you know, um, they don't have to, but you know, whatever. So at the same time, then doesn't that but you know also apply to wanting to just have an update on that child? Well, maybe there could be, and I'm getting way too legal here. I don't even understand what I'm talking about. But maybe if you got to that point where you're helping them with a medical procedure, documents could be amended to say, okay, now that we've, now that I've got this level of involvement, I'm going to want, you know, and it doesn't mean you're going to get it, but you can request, you know, the, the complexion of things has changed. I'm not arm's length anymore. I'm very close to this situation. And I think I, or I would like, not that I deserve, but I would like some some rights and some things that I wasn't entitled to previously. So maybe when these developments occur, it's a chance to maybe rewrite what was originally signed. Um, but again, I think once the woman has, I, don't know, I was going to say possession, that's the wrong word. Once she has the child, the child's been born and it's legally her child, she calls the shots. She can do anything she really wants to at that point. And the man is stuck with either walking away or pursuing it through the courts. And I don't know what success he'd have there, but the woman really is in complete control at that point. So she's going to decide and she could change her mind. She could say, I originally thought it was a good idea. And now I don't think it's a good idea. You really are at the mercy of how that woman decides she wants to raise that child. Okay. Shelby. Um, I think it's more of a situation that 
um, you, you do have the right to know, but it's more of a situation of a, a anonymous, um, like, you know, the parents say, well, you know, they're fine, you know, they're growing up fine, you know, they're, um, in the certain percentile of their class, you know, things like that. Um, but as far as, um, meeting the child, I don't think, you know, that's appropriate. Okay. All right. Uh, welcome power girl. Welcome to the only crazy lady. Uh, Brina says, I believe it's, if it's an open, uh, hold on. She correct herself. If it's an open process, you have that right. But if it's closed, you don't, uh, GP wants to know, is surrogacy expensive? I do believe it is. Um, uh, Crucial says between four and 4,000. I think it all depends upon who, who, who the surrogate is and who, who the parents are. Um, how much you're willing to pay. Um, you know, um, I, okay, so I have a question then. Um, so you hear about, and I know we talked about this a, a couple of months ago on, on another show. So do you, the parent, have the right at some point, and I'm mainly talking about the, the, the sperm uh, d donors here. Do you, the, the, the parent or the mother, at some point have the right to sue the sperm donor for child support? If you we signed all this stuff saying that you're not in this child's life, whatever, that all of a sudden, you know, maybe, you know, you hit on hard times or, you know, your child is going through an operation or they want to take this, you know, whatever, and they want to do this and they want to do this. And you don't have the money and you decide and, and this 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 has happened where you are suing the sperm donor for child child support. But I'm, I'm out of your life. We signed this. Do you have that right to come back to me and say, hey, you, you need to do to do this? Shelby? I would not think so. Um, but, uh, yesterday, I said I have an older son. Um, when my first husband and I got divorced, he insisted that I sign my parental rights over. I disagreed because of that fact. Um, I did pay child support. To him, I paid medical bills. That was the agreement we had. Um, I was told by my lawyer that if I signed over my parental rights, he could come back at any point in time and sue me for child support. And I still would not, he could request that I would not be able to visit with my son if I did not you know, come to that agreement. Okay. So I don't think, you know, I, I, that, you know, I just don't, it's, that's a hard thing to want to, you know, to sign over your parental rights. Um, I think it's very hard on anybody to, um, say you know that they can't be a part of a child's life if they're arrogant and I, this is a very hard show for me so i just wanted to say that <laughs> i'm sorry i'm sorry shelby that's okay it's okay <laughs> i just wanted to say that but go ahead <laughs> so okay did you want to say anything else okay you're passing the mic okay so um Okay, let me read some of these. Uh, Brina says, most people become surrogates out of the kindness of their heart or for money. Either way, you shouldn't be able to go after the surrogate for child support. Uh, and uh, Brina is sending Shelby love. And Crazy Lady says, I had to sign my rights away with my daughter. I'm sorry to hear that, Crazy Lady. So, okay, so at any point... Do you guys feel that a surrogate or a sperm donor um, 
let's say that sperm donor is the anonymous person. You go to the sperm bank and you choose person number 24 JC. Okay. And, you know, you have this baby and for however reason, whatever reason, 24 JC finds out that your daughter is, is, you know, their, their daughter or, uh, many years later, your daughter wants to find out who their father is, and they find out that 24JC, you know, is uh, is their father. Um, um, and they want to meet. Let's say your child is doing some investigation behind your back before they're uh, an adult. They are still a minor. Um, would you tell your child, no, that you cannot meet that person? As a minor, Crucible? well, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, Shelby, go on, then, and then I'll go to Crucible. Um, as a minor, I would prefer them not to. Um, but at the age of um, 16, I would think it would be okay for them to try to start looking. Because, you know, it takes, sometimes it takes several years to find a parent. Okay, but that, okay, but that person, okay, all right, but um, hold on, let me uh, finish reading some of these comments. Um, Crazy Lady says, would Steve let me visit her after I got out of, and we have an awesome relationship, okay. Um, Shelby and is saying thank you for bringing for the love and Shelby is sending the only crazy lady love. Okay, so I'm sorry, Shelby, what was the last thing that you, you just said? <laughs> that um that as a minor, I don't think that they I would advise them not to, but if they were of, of like age sixteen and above, I would let them because um in most cases, especially in adoptive, closed adoptive cases, um, they are, it takes several years to find that parent. Okay. All right. So, um, Crucible, I'm, I'm going to come over to you, but but this is for, for and, and Shelby, I'm going to come back to you. Um, what if your child... Um, and I mean no disrespect to anyone in this room who may be adopted or was born via surrogate or anything like that. I I am pleased, no, no disrespect. What if that child, say, is 10 years old? Um and they're looking around and they're saying, well, I don't look like my brother. I don't look like my sister. I don't look like Aunt Sue. I don't look like either one of my parents. And they just come out and they ask you, would you tell them that they were born via surrogate or born via sperm, sperm donor? I'm not saying that they were adopted. I'm saying that they were born via surrogate or born via sperm sperm donor, would you tell them if they ask like around the age of 10, whatever, how come I don't look like so-and-so? Crucible? Well, I was about to answer one way until you threw the age thing <laughs> in there. Now I've kind of backpedaling a little bit. Well, obviously it depends on what kind of communication took place in the first place. If, 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 this, never, if this has never been discussed at all, and the child thinks that he was born through natural, you know, w w w methods. Then, um, at that point, I would put it off. I would say, "Well, that's just the way genes work. Sometimes, you know, you you, you have identical, you know, you have twins sometimes that don't even look. I have twins, nieces, and nephew who's are twins. Obviously, they don't look alike because they're they're man and a woman. But even when they were young, they didn't look alike. So you could kind of get away with that and say that's the way the gene pool works. It doesn't always, you know, line up the way you think it's going to. Blah blah blah. And then maybe try to kick the can down the road and revisit it later." Um, but I guess I have another question. So I don't know if you know the answer to this, but you kind of, when you, when you made reference to the letters and the, you know, this is John Doe or whoever the donor was when, when a woman is, is looking for a, a surrogate or a sperm donor, 
and I don't mean to trivialize this at all. This is the best way I can frame it. Do they go to the to the sperm bank and they say, you know, kind of like go into a restaurant, you know, I'd like blue eyes, I'd like brown hair, I'd like a build of such and such. I mean, I'm, I'm very ignorant of these processes. No, so yeah, no, there, no, there, there, there is a, there is like a, um, for lack of a better word to say it, like a catalog and they pretty, you know, it's like, what, what are you looking for? Cause, cause with your, a sperm donor, um, I do know that you have to be, be healthy and they do want to know you know, if you went to to uh, to college, you know, um, for some places they want to know 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 what your I, your IQ is, uh, because basically people want to know what type of DNA they're getting. So yeah, they they do. Okay. And every okay. every sperm donor is assigned a uh, a, a number or whatever. Yeah, I guess I would default back to kind of what Shelby said. When you're a minor, you know, you're in my house sort of thing. Um, Once you're 18, even though you still live with me, you're an adult and you can do whatever you want at that point. But I would be reluctant to introduce that fact to a 10 or a 12-year-old child, unless you're prepared for some really, really heavy lifting in terms of the conversation that are going to come next. I don't know that they're quite prepared at that age, but... Certainly by the time they were in high school, I think that would be the right time to, to start having the conversation. Okay. Now, GB says, does anyone have uh, that situation in their family? And Brina says, uh, yep, you can get designer babies now. Yes, you can. Um, okay. So this is my question because now, Crucible, I'm going to kind of put you on the spot because I'm going to go back to yesterday's show about lying. So is this one of those lies that you would tell where you don't hurt someone's feelings and... Um, <laughs> We, and as you're saying, well, that's how genes work. You don't think that a 10 year old, when they find out when they're 16, 17, 18, 20, 24, it's like, well, you lied to me. You lied to me. Well, you've heard the phrase a dream deferred. I would consider this to be the truth delayed. I mean, I, I would, and I would, I would, I would be prepared to have to make that explanation at some point. And I would use the same explanation with my child as I just used here. You, I didn't feel you were ready to handle the, 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 the gravity of what is involved in this particular situation. You were too young to really absorb it and, and appreciate it. So I thought the conversation was better had down the road when you were a little bit older. That's how I would handle it. But so to answer your question, in the short run, yes, you're, you're telling a lie. But if your intention so is to you correct be, it. Okay, but would you, how would you feel, not saying that this would happen, how would you feel if that lie that you told about how they were born um, messed up your relationship? That I'm sorry, it was could you something. That? What if that lie that you told because you thought they were not ready, um, you know, messed up the relationship between you and your child, and they just couldn't get over it? I mean, are you are you prepared for that? No. No, I don't think anybody's prepared for that. But as a parent, you know, you're, you're, you're using your best judgment at the time. And lots of parents, I mean, everybody in life, you know, you make the best decision you can knowing what you know at the time, knowing down the road, you could look back and say, I made a mistake. So I would just tell the child, you know, at that time, this is the best I could do. I felt I, I was very torn. You can go into as much detail as you want. And if, if you are going to hold that against me, I'm very sad about that. But I was trying to protect you. I was trying to put you in the best position to absorb this information. And in my judgment, this was the better time than, than six years ago or whatever it happens to be. And if there's fallout, there's fallout. But hopefully your child would appreciate what you were trying to do, given the complexity of what was going on. Okay, but are you also appreciating how they're feeling at that point? Because, you know, they had a valid question mm -hmm. that they did not look like so-and-so, whatever. And I, I understand, I, I totally understand what you're saying, but can you appreciate how they're feeling? Mm -hmm. No, okay. you're right. You're fair. That's a fair, that's a fair question. No, I could not appreciate it. I don't, I would not know. I'm, I'm guessing you've got two issues now. You've got the whole, who, who is really my father um, and the betrayal, you know, I was asking you, I, I was desperate for information to try to figure out my identity and my origins and all the rest of that stuff that kids at early ages, they, we struggle with all kinds of things, our identity, our sexuality, everything. And I was in a vulnerable spot and you 
lied to me. So now you've got the double-edged problem of figuring out how to reconcile my situation with my surrogate or who my real father is and the fact that my mother did not tell me the truth. So it's a risk. There's no question about it. Okay. Shelby? And Shelby's gone. Okay. Okay. So, okay. So don't you think that, again, going back to, to yesterday's show, don't you think that's a major lie? Because I think that it is. I, I think that's a major lie. I, I can't disagree with that. You know, um, the only thing that I would, again, fall back on is the age. It is a major lie. There's no question about it. And it's a risky lie. And I didn't really consider the, 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 the fallout of the child saying, you know, how dare you? How could you? Knowing, you know, where I was mentally and psychologically with the whole thing, how could you not level with me and come clean and trust that I would be able to handle that information? That's a huge risk. But no, I'm, I'm not going to disagree with you. That is a major lie for sure. Regardless of whether you have the best interest in mind or not, it's still a major lie. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. GB says, I would be open to adopt, but not be a sperm donor. Okay. And Minnesota says it is, but it's a hard question to answer. Okay. So um, I'm going to switch this up, up a bit. And I said the whole thing about what if the person, you know, the child needs a, a, is sick and they need it, you know, some medical um, help from the biological parent. And you know who that biological parent is. Do you think that um, in terms of ethics, now I'm throwing in something completely different. In terms of ethics, and yes, this has happened, when a parent, parents, whatever, they have another child in order to help another, help the sick child. So... Do you think that's ethical? And do you ever tell the child that you're having that, you know, for lack of a better way to say, it, well, we really weren't planning on having you, but we had you because, you know, we needed your bone marrow to help your little brother. I would think that to be highly unethical. Um, and certainly to bring a child into the, and I understand you're trying to save another child. I get all that. And it doesn't mean the child that came second or whenever they came would be not loved, you know, but to explain to a child that you had a utility, there was a utility to your birth that went beyond, we wanted another child out of our love for children. I don't know that that's something I could get over as, as a child, depending on how old I was when I was told, even if I was an adult, that I was used to service, you know, to solve another problem. As, as happy as I might have been to save my sibling's life, that's a gratifying thing. Who wouldn't want that? But to know that you were not brought into the world first and foremost, born of love for you, I don't know. That's a, First of all, I do think it's eth unethical because you're playing God. But second of all, I think you're really, really going to mess with that person's head long term because of just what I just what I said there there could be some insecurity going on there a lack of confidence am I really loved what if I what if my brother or my sister was healthy I wouldn't be here right now uh, yeah I would try to steer clear of that one if I could okay but you do know that that, that has happened Oh yeah, I, I put, I, I'm, I'm familiar with it yes I'm very familiar with it I, I don't know even if I wasn't familiar with it, I wouldn't doubt it for a minute. I'm sure people do that stuff all the time. I'm just curious, Howard. I'm going to put it back on you. Do you think it's ethical? I mean, that's a sincere question. No, no, I don't. I, mm -hmm. I, I do not think that is ethical, and um, I would never something that I would never consider um, because, again, I do believe that every person has the right to know where they come from. I think every person has a right to know who their parents are. Um, how they got here, um, you know, whether 
it were sperm donor adoption, you know, you were a one night stand, whatever. I, I believe that every person has, has that, that, that right. And to do that, um, to have, to have a child or to know that you were basically used for, for a part, I think that's, I think that's really crappy, but parents have have done it uh welcome sam i am and welcome shy lady so um well would you would you want to be would you want to know if you were the product of a one night stand i yes i would i like like i said i think everybody has the right to know because sooner or later the questions are going to come come around who is my mother who is my father you know, um, what are you going? Well, well, well. How did you, you meet? And the thing about it is, for for some things, yes, some things do go go to the grave. You know, with people, but at the same time, there's always that one person. There's always that best friend who knows, who you know, ends up forty years later telling their children somehow or another. You may find find out. So if if your child or my child is is coming to me. I think that they should should know. And not only that, in terms of just medical, you know, whatever, um, just in terms of, you know, if something were ever to happen, that's something that you just need to, to know. You know, is it harsh? Is it hard to hear? Yes. Would I want to hear it? No. But at the same time, if I'm asking the question and I want to know where I come from, then at the same time, I have to be prepared for the answer. So, uh, you know, so, okay, let me look. Uh, Brina says, it was a wow, that's tough to hear. Wow, solid. Uh, yeah, that would make me feel bad as hell. GB says, man, this conversation makes me not want to have kids anymore. Uh, hello everyone. See now, you know, now I'm, I'm, I'm worried about Shelby. So I hope that this conversation wasn't too rough on her. Um, so I don't know. So I'm gonna have to drop her a message later and, and, and check and, and check on her. Yeah. I didn't even think of that. She dropped off right about the time she was starting. Yeah. To yeah. So I don't, I don't, so I'm have to, I'm have to check, check, check on her. Let's see. Uh, Shiley says, even when you go to the doctor, you're asked about your family medical history. You are, you know, um, you know, because in, in cases of like cancer and, 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 and things like that, it's like, you know, um, especially if you're, there are some like for breast cancer, there are some women who have a, a history in their family, you know, their, their mom may, may have had it, their grandmother, you know, it could be something that runs in the family. You know, so those things are important. So, um, I mean, what do you all think? I mean, do you think that, do you agree with me or do you think that I'm wrong? Because I believe that every person has the right and should know where they come, come from and they should not be lied to. I agree with that, um, provided you're prepared, not just willing, but prepared, there's a difference. To clean up the mess that's going to come from, I use the example of one night stand. Um, you know, because now I know where I came from. I'm assuming if you came from a one night stand, you, you probably don't know your father. Um, so, what's the difference between I used to date this man for a few years and I got pregnant with, with you? My, my son or my daughter, and um, I don't see the men anymore, um, but we, you, we were in a relationship, but we don't, we're, we're not anymore. And so that's why you don't know your father. That's different than I just hooked up with a guy at a bar one night, never saw him again, got pregnant, and I decided to have you, even though this man was a perfect stranger, never saw him again, didn't, don't even know when his birthday is, what his favorite foods are, where he was born, but I decided to go ahead and have his child anyway. I don't know how that benefits. You know, there's, there's something to be said for the truth. And there's something to be said for a little bit of restraint. Because you have to ask yourself, what's the outcome that I'm hoping to get here? Is it going to be closure or 
peace in the mind of the child. If that's th- if that's the goal, I don't think you're going down the right path there. So truth is 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 important, but it's also important to consider how that's going to be received to another person, how they're going to process it and reconcile. Now that you've unburdened yourself and you've told the truth, now they've got the burden on them. And is it fair? Can they process it? Are they ready? And and have you accomplished anything except making yourself feel a little bit better? I'm just playing okay. devil's advocate. That's no, all. no, you okay? And I and I and I'm, I I want to I want to answer that, but I want to read what some of you guys are saying. Um, let's see. Uh, Charlie says even when you go to the doctor, you're asked about your family medical history. Brina says yes. If you ask a question, you can't get mad at the answer. And uh, Shadi says, "Salad, I totally agree with you that everyone should know that their 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 history." Okay, so so then let me ask ask this: considering that technology has come so far, and as Brina said earlier, you know you can have designer babies now. You can you know have this this and pick this out and all this other stuff. Then. Should you, the parent, should you, the person who is asking for the surrogate or who goes to a sperm bank or asks someone to be a sperm donor or, you know, um, um, should you, um, I mean, even in cases of adoption, should you think of all these things and questions and do people think of this before, I mean, even if you're, even if you're having a, a biological child, you know, you or you have that one night stand, you know, not just for the woman, because the woman usually gets blamed, but for for the man, too. Are you all thinking 20 years down the road that there's going to be this this child that can be born or you're having the surrogate, you know, you're having this baby via a surrogate or you're having this baby via, you know, sperm, sperm donor. Then should should you think of all these things that may come up? Because. A child is going to ask where they come from. If they don't ask when they're 10, they're going to ask when they're 15. If they don't ask when they're 15, then they are going to ask when they're an, an adult. And I think it's, in, it's my opinion, I think it's very selfish of someone to take that knowledge to the grave with, 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 with them. I, I, I think that's very selfish. So are you... As you're planning your life, oh, we're going to have this little baby. Oh, and yes, and you know, and yes, and they're doing this, and we're going to do this. Are you prepared for the questions? So, Cruz, I understand what you're saying is, is the child, you know, prepared to get those answers? But are you prepared for the questions? And is this something you may want to think twice about before you do that one night stand, before you ask that that surrogate, before you ask that sperm sperm donor? Well, to answer your question, I don't think, but I think they should. I don't think a lot of people in that situation or even people who are having children, you know, in a quote unquote, you know, um, traditional way, think a whole lot down the line. There's so much going on at the time they're making these decisions about whether to have a child, how to have it, surrogate, adoption. There's all kinds of stuff swirling around emotions and decisions and if you're in that situation where you're a surrogate or a sperm donor, yes, I think you. if you're having children in the traditional way, you don't have to get ahead of yourself and think of how you're going to handle this problem and that problem. Those will take care of themselves. But you've, you're creating a situation. I'm not saying you're creating a problem, but you're creating a situation beyond just normal childbirth. And you need to think down the road for the different milestones at, at his fifth birthday, her fifth birthday. Is it appropriate to have this conversation when they're nine or 10? Is it appropriate to have this conversation? If, if I don't initiate the conversation and I'm thinking, well, I'll wait till they're 10. And all of a sudden when they're seven, the questions start coming at me. That is, I think, a situation you need to be prepared for um, because you've, you've created a situation that's going to require questions at some point. But I also think it depends on your relationship with your child. Once your child gets to be a certain age, you know the child pretty well. You know what their emotions are. You know what their personality is, their intellect, um, what they can handle, what they can't handle. So I think you got to kind of make some judgment decisions on when you think your child is ready. But Again, I, I agree with you and Shy Lady about people needing to know the origins and where they came from. It's very important for, for closure and our identities. But I still go back to that one night stand question and how do I reconcile telling my child that I thought so little of you that I had 
a, I decided to go ahead with a preg- an unwanted pregnancy from a man I just met. I don't know how those words would sound if I were hearing them as the child. Well, in today's environment, they're not going to have a choice but to go to go through with it. But that's another that's another topic. But um, you know, at the same time, though, you can somewhere along the line, you're going to get into a conversation with your child where something's going to come up at school where they're working on the family tree. Um, something's going to come up where the question is going to come up sooner than you would hope. So again, what do you tell that child? I mean, if, 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 you know, if, if you're supposed to, you know, you're supposed to have the father daughter dance and you're divorced. And your daughter comes home and says, well, you know, and you can't, you know, stand your ex and your ex can't stand you and you all can't be in the same room together. You know, um, I mean, what do you I mean, what do you because sooner or later, something's going to come up where. The question's going to be asked. And children are not stupid. Well, I remember my mother telling me, you know, when she was raising us, she had a blueprint for when she thought she would have each of these conversations with each of us. You know, the where where do we come from? Is there a Santa Claus? You know, is there an Easter Bunny? All these different, you know, questions that come up. She said, I had an idea when I was going to have these conversations, but I told myself that that goes out the window the minute you start asking questions. And she said, I, that's how I, that's what I followed it. And I said, I had an idea, but it always, I always had to deviate from it because like she's, like I said, and you said, I want to have the conversation at age 10. The questions start coming at age seven and she made a commitment. And as far as I know, she followed through on it. As soon as the question started, she would start answering them honestly. She wouldn't volunteer anything at age seven, but if the questions came then, then she would deal with them head on. And like I said, I think she, I don't, as far as I know, she did that. So I think when kids start asking questions, they become, like you said, they're not stupid. They become very aware. And if they're asking questions, they're well down the road. It doesn't just pop into their heads. They've kicked this thing around. They've given it some thought. They've looked at it from a couple of different angles. And now they're, now they're out of answers. Then they come to you and you're like, okay, now I'm handing it off to you, mom. I've taken this thing down the road as far as I can trying to figure it out. I, I need you now. And when the questions start, you need to answer them. Okay. All right. Now, GB says, uh, the kid says, Mom, why do all my brothers have different dads? And the mom says, I was young and and, and dumb, son. So, um, so again, I, I come back to um, my original question with surrogates and, and, and sperm donors. Um, and now I'm going to say that one night stand that where you end up, you know, you, it could be a one night stand where you know the person. It could be a one night stand where you didn't know, know the person at all. Um, but let's say, um, let's say you do know the person one, one night stand. Um, the woman gets pregnant, um, but she doesn't want you in her life. But you kind of want to stick stick around. Do you push, or do you just let it sit and marinate for a couple of years? Um, what do you do? Well, obviously, when the child is a minor, I'm, I'm guessing you're very restricted and the mother can control, you know, I don't want you to contact the child. I don't want phone calls. I don't want letters. I don't want cards on birthdays. I don't want any of that stuff. And she can control that because she controls the mail. She controls the communication flow. The kids are, are too young. So she will be able to dictate the terms of anything. I wouldn't think that until the child is 18 or older that you would be able to try to establish some kind of contact with them, but you'd have to be respectful of the mother's wishes, e even though you want to be in that child's life. And you can certainly say, Hey, look, anytime that changes, I would like to be part of this child's life and make your wishes known. But the woman is in complete and total 100% control and you're going to get what she decides you're going to get. 
Okay, and uh, let's see. Uh, GB says uh, crucible, but she still wants the the, the, the guy's money. Okay, so That's is it then, then then crucible? Is there a difference between the one night stand? The father wants to stick around. The surrogate, the mom wants to. The biological mother wants to stick around. Sperm donor. Uh, if if it's a known sperm sperm donor, the sperm donor wants to wants wants to stick around. Is there a difference between surrogate sperm donor and then one night stand? Yes, yes, there are. I mean, I think right off the bat, just on the nature of the surrogate, they know going in, and they may want to change the rules down the road, but they know going in that they're they're they have no rights that their role is extremely restricted and it doesn't extend beyond the fertilization process. That's where it begins and that's where it ends. So you know going in that you don't have any rights. The, the one night stand guy, he does have rights because he fathered the child in a, and maybe it's because it's in a more traditional way. I don't, I don't know, I mean that's not fair. But I don't believe you should have more than two parents involved in any child's life. If you want to, when there's an, an adult conversation to take place, you know, by the way, this is the person who actually fertilized you, you know, blah, 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 and you think you can have that conversation, that's fine. But anytime you start introducing a third person into a child's life under the guise that they have a role in raising them or bringing them into this world, I think that's highly confusing, and I just don't think it's helpful. Okay, so what about... Um uh, parents are children of divorce. You know, your your mom gets remarried, your father gets gets remarried. You end up with two moms. You end up with two dads. Mm. Is, is 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 that any different? Yeah, I think it is different because they're not your dad. They're not. They're they're a um, fa uh, father by marriage. They may or may okay. not adopt you, but they're not well, okay, your father. But Okay, but what if they do a, a, adopt you or, and, and what if your child is calling them mom or, or calling them dad? What do you do? Don't, don't, don't call them that because they're not your mother, they're, they're not your, your, your father? No, but usually you're going you're gonna to say that if you, I'm not that familiar with, and a lot, things can get messy, I understand that, but usually, you know, kids know if there's a, um, and usually it happens when they're very young, if, if a mother gets remarried and the, the new husband comes in and says, I want to raise these children. I will adopt them or I'll just raise them. And usually the other father, you're only going to call one person dad, I think, for the most part. You know who your biological mm, father is. I, I kind of disagree with that. I think well, depending upon the, the relationship, I think that, you know, the, if the other, the person that your mom is marrying or the person that your dad is, is marrying, you know, if you all have a good relationship, you may very well call them mom and you just have two moms. So, I mean, I think, I mean, because you look at uh, couples that are gay, you have, you're, you're calling them both dad, you're calling them both mom. So what's the difference? I, I think, you know, as the old consenting adults, if, if, if the people involved decide that everybody's ready to have this conversation and the surrogate is, a, is appreciative of being involved. And I think that's the key word because they don't have to be involved. You're being involved at the in, invitation of the parents. So I think it's important for them to know their role and act appropriately uh, and not try to act like a parent because they're not. They're a sperm donor. There's a difference. So I think if the roles are, are identified correctly and people stay in their lanes, yeah, I think there's a way to make it work at some point, and that point would probably be adulthood. Okay, and uh, Shalai, before I come to you, I just want to read what GP says. Uh, GP says, uh, many grandparents are raising their grandchildren a as their own, and he's he's absolutely right. Uh, so, and thank you everyone for liking the show. Uh, Sh Sh Shalai, welcome. Hi, hello everybody. Um, I kind of want to um, agree with uh, some of the points that uh, Crucible made regarding um, usually the kid calls somebody mom or whatever. You know, it's not every household, but I, I happen to have a family member who um, is a uh, female and is married to a woman. And she had kids uh, with her ex-husband. Um, 
before she got with this with this woman and they got married now when she when she met this woman her kids were kind of young like preteen age i want to say they were probably between the ages of um eight and uh probably 13 or 14 so they were already calling their mom mom and this other woman they just call her by her name but they do accept them both as being their moms but maybe that's why they call their mother still mom and the other woman they call her by her name because their mom was was with with them at least eight years before this other person came into their lives so there's no confusion about who's 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 the biological mom or whatever and uh, that's just one example that i know of and that's a real life situation so it's not a what if but i do know that there are situations where um people may not be like that but mm -hmm. i kind of agree with with crucible that most of the time particularly if those kids were raised before the other person came in and they've been calling that 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 biological mom mom i don't think in all likelihood they're gonna You went out, shy lady. She's probably driving. Hello? Okay. Sorry. Yeah, you, Sorry. you, 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 you no, went that, out. That was a spam a spam calling me. But, can, can, um, can you repeat the very last thing you said? Um, you don't think that they're going to uh, do what? Call? I was, say, I was saying that in all likelihood, I believe that if a, if a person um, is in a situation like that where they have two moms or two dads, I don't think um, that they're going to call both people, mom and dad, it, it, it would, first of all, it would be confusing. If anything, they may call that second person that came into their life, mom, this by her name, you know, whatever. But it's, I think that it's, it is, it would, it would definitely be confusing calling two people in the household, mom. Okay. So two, calling two okay. people, dad. Okay. So I ask uh, Crucible, what if you're in a um, same sex marriage and you have two moms and two, two dads, you do have kids that do call their moms moms and dads dads they have two fathers yeah but i, I was saying like in in the case that i know i have a relative okay who's female okay. and gay and she's married to a woman but she okay. had these kids before her and this but, woman but it does up. happen but it does happen where you were parents where children do say i have two dads i have oh, two yeah, moms yeah. Okay, oh, definitely, okay definitely they they do yeah her kids do um, call call the other woman, you know, their mom also, but they don't actually call her mom. They call her by her name and they call okay. Them okay. the biological mom, mom. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, guys, um, this has been a heavy show. Um, we did get, get deep. Um, does anybody want to put anything into the chat before I start wrapping it up? Let's see. And everyone, thank you for liking the show. And tomorrow's Thursday. So tomorrow's my Thursday fun show. So guys, we're going to try to keep it fun. So everybody fun, fun tomorrow. I haven't posted the title yet uh, because I'm kind of looking at two that I kind of want to do. Um, let's see. Uh, great show. Important topic. Thank you, Brina. Um, so and I did reach out to Shelby while we were talking and she is fine. She just needed to take a moment. So um yeah uh so uh uh chris will you want to say anything before we wrap it up no another great topic solid i love these shows where you get confronted with complex decisions that have a lot of moving parts on them it's another reminder that life is messy and we think we know what we would do in certain situations until we're confronted with it and we actually have to make a decision and all of a sudden the calculus changes when we're making decisions in the abstract we can make one decision when we apply context we may need to make another one so these shows are always good reminders of the moral complexity and the messiness of life so anyway good show and thanks for having me well thank you very much and guys i know that you know um i talk about things that um usually that other people don't want to talk about or you know it's hard to talk about whatever um I have been criticized by my show, uh, you know, for some of my, my topics, but, you know, um, uh, next week I'm going to be talking about, you know, some, some other things, um, because I'm just one of those people like, you know, 
don't talk after the person has walked away. You know, you have something to say about something or something, you know, get out in the open and, and, and talk about it because, you know, um, talking about it when everybody has, has, you know, the person that you want to confront or whatever leaves, it, it kind of just de 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 defeats the purpose. So I try to have, you know, topics where um, we do have meaningful conversations and everybody's not going, going to uh, uh, agree. We're going to push, push back on each other. Um, you know, some of us may get upset. Some of us may, you know, not, not like it, you know, get pissed off, whatever. Um, but I do believe that that's one of the reasons why we have some of the issues that we have is because people don't want to talk, you know, and um, I'm grateful that I have people in my life um, who we talk and we get down into the weeds. And again, we don't always uh, agree with each other, but we talk about some of everything. Um, so, and that's a, you know, um, and that's why I try to have my Thursday fun shows because I know Monday through Wednesday we can get like, dang, solid. <laughs> you know? So if anybody has a fun show you all want to do, let me know. Um, I do have two topics that I'm mulling over for tomorrow. But I really, again, guys, I really want my Thursday show to be fun where, where, where we're laughing and we're joking. Um, you know, um, uh, I still, one of my favorite shows that I did was the Yep, I Faked It show where Kristen came on and and the toilet paper show just I mean just I I just have fun with with, with, with shows like that to just make me laugh. Uh so um that's what I'm hoping um to have tomorrow. So everyone enjoy the rest of your day or evening wherever you are in the world. Go where the wind takes you. And again I hope I did not um upset yet. <laughs> You remember, Brina, I still listen to that show every so often and I crack up literally every time. It makes me laugh out loud every single time. It just, that show just, because she just gets, talk about getting into the weeds. She gives you a roadmap and, it, and I'm laughing so hard that I have tears in my eyes. So guys, if you guys haven't seen that show, I don't know what number it is. Uh, it was probably about six months ago, I think, but it's called, yep, I I faked it. <laughs> and, and I have not seen Kristen again. She hasn't been back and I haven't seen her on any other show. So, um, yeah. But anyway, guys, um, I hope to see you tomorrow. Not sure what the topic is, but it will be posted uh, s sometime today. Again, fun, 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 guys. We're going to try to laugh tomorrow. So, again, enjoy your day or evening where you are in the world. Go where the wind takes you and I hope to see you tomorrow. Bye. <laughs> And Crucible, Charlotte, and Shelby, thank you for popping up. As always, uh, Rena, thank you for your participation. GP, everyone, thank you so much. Thank you for liking the show. I appreciate it so much. Sam, I am. Uh, Sim Sim Ab Abdallah, welcome and thank you for popping in. Blood Ninja, aka Ninja Bunny, Frankie. Minnesota, Power Girl, Juju, 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 all of you, thank you, the only crazy lady, and everyone listening on any other streaming platforms, thank you for listening, you are also appreciated. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day.